All right, welcome everybody to today's webinar by the IEA HSC Solar Academy on the topic of current developments in thermal energy storage materials. This is a webinar by the IEA HSC Solar Academy and hosted by us, ISIS, the International Solar Energy Society. Before we start, a quick word on ISIS and who we are, because I can see many new participants are joining us on the webinar today. So ISIS, who are we? We are a UN accredited membership NGO founded in the 1950s and accredited with the UN since 1992. And we represent individual as well as corporate members from countries all around the world. We have a very strong mission, which is 100% renewable energy for all used efficiently and wisely. And to that end, we offer a range of key activities to spread this mission. One of our key activities are our biannual congresses, which take place somewhere around the world. One is the Solar World Congress. The next one is gonna be in 2025. We just came back from New Delhi in India for the Solar World Congress 2023. And the next um, conference that's coming up next year is Eurosun 2024. And I'm gonna speak to that a bit more as well. We also have two key publications. You will certainly know Solar Energy Journal, which is one of the oldest and longest standing solar energy um, journals. And then in 2021, we added our fully open access solar energy advances channel to that. We also obviously have online measures such as the webinar you're listening in, in to today, and as well as online and offline education initiatives for young researchers. And we also work in the department of knowledge sharing, for example, through measures such as infographics and our solar energy museum. Now, as we get into the webinar, I wanna have a quick word on the Q&A session. So we will first hear all of the presentations of the webinar today, and then we will have a cumulative Q&A session at the end. You can send in your questions using the chat and you can start sending in your questions anytime throughout the webinar. So as you are listening to one of the presentations and you have a question that comes up for you, send it in, in the chat. Ideally, please indicate who the question is for and please also keep it short and precise. And now it's my immense pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of today's webinar, Bärbel App. Bärbel is the founder and managing director of the German consultancy Solrico, and she's responsible for the international newsletter on the web portal Solar Thermal World Org, where she exports, reports exclusively about market and technology trends in the solar heating and cooling sector. So Bärbel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arabella, for the nice introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here again. It's our last webinar of this year, but we will have already plans for next year and we will continue with this series of webinars. Yeah, I want to share my screen and uh, show you some details about the IAA Solar Heating and Cooling Program. Yes. Oops. Oh, well. <laughs> Is it visible? Yes, thank you. Yes, perfect. Okay. Well, the IEA SHC program is a project focused international research collaboration. You see on the world map here the colored countries on dark red, which are direct members, and the yellow or orange marked countries are members via sponsors. So we have a huge crowd of very dedicated experts on solar heating and cooling, more than 200, that work on, that work on nine current solar projects, research collaborations that we have listed here, you know, among them is solar neighborhood planning, solar process heat, solar cooling for Sunbelt region, we have solar energy buildings, as we have here today about compact thermal energy storages is an important issue, we have solar district heating, solar hot water for 2030 and integrated lighting and uh, life cycle analysis for SEH technology, so you see a wide range of topics. If you want to join one of these topics and join a task and work with them, you first have to check whether your country is an IEA SHC member, either directly, the red color or orange via an organization. Then you can learn more about a task on the IEA SHC website. We have sub pages for each of the tasks. This is how we call these research groups. And um, you can find on the task subpage the task manager. And then you contact the task manager and discuss your interest and your expertise, and they will inform you they have regular meetings and you can join their meetings. This is the procedure. 
The IA HHC, very important to notice, um, we are not just publishing research-oriented results, but also there's a lot of training materials on our website, case studies, fact sheets, databases. We also have a lot of tools that were de developed within the task work, and all is available under um, a sub-page which is called publications. What we else do we offer? I already mentioned the webinar series. It's a quarterly based webinar hosted by ISIS. We have different topics along the, the, the year. We also have on the YouTube channel a lot of videos with experts and also the, all the solar, the previous Solar Academy recordings are available on our website. And also a nice option, we offer online trainings. That means uh, on the request of an IAA SHC member country or member organization, uh, we have particular trainings, either large scale or buildings or um, solar cooling or whatever interests you. The past trainings were in the Caribbean. We had China, West Africa, South Africa, and United Kingdom. Where to find more information? Obviously on the website. Um, this is the, the blue uh, iashc.org dash publications is the very summary page where you find all the publications where you can filter under particular topics. You can follow us on social media, LinkedIn or X, and uh, you will have the YouTube channel which gives you a lot of videos. And if you have additional questions, please contact the Secretariat on your disposal at any time. Uh, again, uh, two very flagship reports that are regularly published by the program. One is the Solar Heat Worldwide report, which is published once a year in June. It's a buff 80 page report, the most comprehensive data gathering on solar heating and cooling application market and technology development, quoted a lot by big organizations like IEA, and you find it free for download at the link which is going giving in yellow below here. Uh, the semi-annual newsletter, which is called Solar Update, is published in June and in December, and it highlights particular, um, yeah, sometimes events or uh, content from the tasks, but also administrative works, uh, like administrative issues, like the new chair or new countries or whatever is important to mention. So this was my short introduction, and um, I would like to start now with our webinar today uh, on current developments on thermal energy storages. Um, it's a split webinar. You can always choose with our webinars uh, between an early uh, or an afternoon GMT time and an early GMT time on Thursday, whatever is convenient for your own um, for your own time zone and please also note if you listen to the recording now because you are already on Thursday then please type in questions as well while we go over the um, presentations because we will raise these questions then in the separated Q&A on Thursday as well. So, well, this is now a time to introduce um, the really chair of this task 67 on compact uh, thermal energy storage, which is Wim van Helden. He is um, working with the IA Intec in Austria as a senior expert on solar energy storages, but he's also an independent consultant. He has two more hats. Uh, Wim is a board member of the European Technology and Innovation Platform on Renewable Heating and Cooling, and he's member of the Scientific Committee of IRES, the International Renewable Energy Conference that will take next week in Aachen, Germany. And he will take a few minutes to give us an introduction into the topic of compact thermal energy storage materials. So Wim, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Barbara, for the introduction. Um, I will um, show you a, a first introduction on the task uh, 67, task 40, with the long title, Compact Thermal Energy Storage Materials Within Components Within Systems. Uh, before we dive into the, uh, into the deep with the three following uh, presentations. Tim? I cannot see the in. full screen. Yes, that's strange. And Which screen do you in see? On your own presentation. Okay. We can only see half of your screen. Oh, no. It's... Okay, then I have to go out and to check in again. Okay, one second.
Okay, and then. Mm -hmm. Now it should be visible. It's strange, no. it's still cut. <clears throat> we have never had that, Arabella. <laughs> no. So when what happens is when you go to full screen mode, it zooms in on the uh, presentation. So we we yeah. have a zoomed version, so we can't can only read half of it. Um, okay. Can you zoom out manually? And this way, uh, if I swap the screen. Mm -mm. Same issue. Okay. And I think I will stop PowerPoint completely. Hmm. And then try it again. Yeah, if you can let me share it. One second. It seems as if it is shared already now. Mm -mm. Not sure. One second. Here you go. Now you can share again. Okay. Yeah, now that looks good. I think. Okay. Thank you. Very I, know, I now got another menu uh, showing uh, the different possibilities for my screen. Oh, ah, yeah. Okay. okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, apologies for this delay. Um, first, uh, introductory slides on the uh, task 67, task 40 uh, on compact thermal energy storage materials within components within systems. It's a joint task, meaning that it's a collaboration between two uh, programs of the IEA. Uh, the one program is the solar heating and cooling program, and the other is the energy storage program. And within the task, more than 60 experts from 14 countries collaborate together, working on the topic in different uh, subtasks. We started uh, in June 2021, and it's a three-year task, meaning that we will end mid of next year. Uh, it's uh, one task in a series of, of tasks that we already had on the, the topic of compact thermal energy storage materials, which uh, started in uh, 2010. So what is it all about? It's on compact thermal energy storage materials, uh, meaning that we are looking into either phase change materials, PCM, like, like here, this uh, this cube of uh, ice that is melting. It's a phase change in which a lot of energy can be stored or thermochemical materials, which can be absorption materials or uh, hydrates or uh, redox uh, reactions. What we are interested in uh, with respect to the material is uh, its characterization. So what are the properties of this material? How can we measure it? its development, how can we improve the materials, how can we make it better for certain applications, and uh, the testing of these materials in, in, uh, in components. So what is the performance of a storage material when we have a heat exchanger connected to it or a chemical uh, reactor? These are all uh, topics and questions of, uh, of the task. And the, the goals of, of this task is to um, work on uh, understanding the, the factors that influence the storage density and the performance degradation of uh, these uh, CTES materials. Also want to be able to characterize the materials in a, such a way that it's reliable, that it's independent of who is uh, doing the test and it's uh, reproducible. We would also like to have methods in which we, with which we can effectively determine the state uh, of charge of a CTES storage unit. And, uh, the aim is also to have the knowledge on how to design optimized heat exchanges and reactors uh, for CTES technologies. This 
these are the goals and our approach is working in sub um and uh, working also together so we begin with the applications in which application is a thermal storage material needed and what are the boundary conditions for these applications so the application boundary conditions abc could be temperatures or powers or the number of cycles in which uh, this application is used per year or per day uh, the contact with other materials like, like copper or stainless steel or plastic and the mechanical conditions under which the material is being transported or stored. These um, boundary conditions are used to improve the storage materials themselves. So what we do is we add um, uh, other uh, components or we um, tweak a little bit the molecule, molecular uh, structure of the material in order to have uh, better um, characteristics of this um, of this material. We also test the material's performance on a small scale then and um, verify whether these tests are suited uh, in order to, to have the proper qualities of the material and also use the boundary conditions for component development. So one level higher. Um, storing the material in a component and then charging and discharging it and then testing whether um, the performance is the performance that we would need in a certain application. This uh, material or component in interaction is also important in order to determine what are the uh, factors that influence the lifetime of a storage material. And in the end, we would like to have a design process of, uh, of the component that is uh, optimized and that uh, is ideally bringing us to a proper configuration with the properties uh, of the component that are suited for the application. The task uh, is structured around four sub five subtasks. So one task on material characterization and uh, the material database. The second task on the actual improvement of the CTS material. The third task on the state of charge determination for the component. The fourth task on the stability of phase change materials and thermochemical materials. And the fifth task on component level to determine the uh, effective uh, performance with innovative materials of these components. In the webinar, you will uh, see and hear about three topics that are further deepened in this webinar. Uh, the first topic is on the question, how can we test material properties reliably and re replicably? The second question is, uh, how can we determine the state of charge, SOC, of a compact thermal storage material uh, and component? And the third question that will be answered in the third part of the webinar is which factors determine the stability of the storage material. So enjoy the webinar. If you have more questions, you can either contact me or Andreas Hauer, who is the task manager for the energy storage program of this task. Thanks and enjoy it. Thank you, um, Wim. I think that was very important for us to get uh, understand a bit the framework of your very complex task because Wim manages, you know, you saw a whole university of researchers with these two, two rows of, of subtasks and uh, PCM and TCM oriented. We have learned these short forms now as well, phase change material and thermal chemical materials, which is a very important uh, terms that will be used a lot. Thanks, Wim. Mm -hmm. Great. So we will go to the next speaker. We have Dr. Helena Navarro. She is re senior research in chemical engineering at the University of Birmingham in the UK. She did her PhD at the University of Barcelona originally. Her research focuses on the development of thermal energy storage solutions from laboratory scale towards commercialization, both in academic and in industrial environment. She includes this includes thermal and thermochemical energy storage materials. And the title of her presentation today is Round Robin Test on Thermal Conductivity and Thermal Diffusivity. This is a difficult word, diffusivity. Probably you can spell this much better than me. So the floor is yours, Helena. So good morning, afternoon. 
everyone. So let me try to share my my screen. So can you see the presentation? Yes, but not in the presenter mode yet. Maybe it's a bit slow. Yeah. We'll go to the presenter mode. Now? Yes, now perfect. Yes. I'm trying to. Oh, no, now I think you cannot see it. Can you see? Yeah, yeah it works. Okay, yeah, it, it's moving. I see something different. Sorry. Oh, so <laughs> sometimes it's a bit slow in reacting your own screen as well, but it looks good. Okay, so thank you again for uh, for your presentation and thank you very much for all of you joining today to this uh, webinar. So my talk is about one of the subtasks that we uh, presented within the Energy Storage Technology Collaboration Program. So it's task for the subtask A. And I would like to present the current status of this subtask that it has been uh, the work done is through uh, what it's called round robin test. So this is the outline of the of my presentation, and I will go through why we're organizing a round robin test on thermal conductivity and thermal diffusivity, and some of the steps that we have agreed uh, among the partners uh, during this process. So the material that we have been first testing is a phase change material. So the motivation. So one of the first steps to design a thermal energy storage system is to select which technology we are going to use. And that ends up selecting a material that will store thermal energy in a temperature change, phase change, or chemical reaction. So that depends. But those materials have uh, characteristic properties that will affect the performance of the system. So really it's crucial to determine in an accurate way uh, the properties in the working temperature range. So here are some of the characteristics that are needed during the selection process. And besides, of course, that it's one of the, the main factors on selection, uh, we're gonna focus on thermal conductivity and thermal diffusivity because it can be a selection parameters when we need materials that store and releases heat in a specific time. So when we have this constraint, we really need uh, accurate values for people to design the final system. So to measure thermal conductivity or thermal uh, diffusivity of thermal energy storage materials, we can find different techniques and methods. Here on the, on the left side, you can see uh, the different techniques and uh, with the temperature ranges that they cover and the thermal conductivity values that they cover. Some techniques are used mainly for insulators. So you can see these narrow um, bars, but other can measure highly conductive materials. So among all of these, you can see that LFA and TPS are the two more versatile methods. We're not gonna go into details of these methods, but here I want to show you, this is from, from a review on the, your right side, uh, that these are the techniques that are currently being used to measure thermal conductivity materials. So here you can see from in the solid form, liquid form, sensible heat storage materials, latent heat, and thermochemicals. So at the end, what I want to, to show is that there's a huge variety of techniques that it has been used, using transient and steady state methods to measure thermal energy storage materials. So what does this mean? That currently it's quite difficult to have comparable results. So what we're trying to do now in this subtask is to assess the methods that it has been used uh, through the different partners of, of this task and to try to um, understand the associated uncertainties and how we can standardize protocols that will allow us to reproduce and compare uh, thermal properties, thermal conductivity among the different laboratories. So to do that, what we can do is what uh, it's called a round robin test. And we can describe it as an inter-laboratory test where we measure and analyze the results uh, performed independently several times. 
So that aligns really quite well with the aim of this subtask, that is to develop standardized measurements procedures for thermal energy storage materials. And the, the subtask A1.1, A1 what we do is focus on thermal conductivity, thermal depressivity. But there are others for specific heat, for density, and for other properties that we have seen in previous slides that are important for uh, selection. So the round robin test here you can see in this um, image consists of mainly three steps. So and these steps are organized and designed uh, using what is called uh, minimum necessary information. So this uh, will be in the form of tables that partners, laboratories uh, will transfer just for communicating. Okay. So here we can see that we have uh, an example is we have N partners, okay? And the main three steps uh, that we will carry out during the round robin test is to identify the general information, so collection of uh, equipment or, or the criteria, to develop SOP, so the protocols, the type of test we are, are going to carry on, and uh, then to measure and the third and final to analyze. And this process can be done iteratively. So we can optimize our results. So we need to, at the end, have an idea of the precision and accuracy of our values. So if we move to analyze what we have been doing in subtask A1.1, here on the right, uh, uh, right top, you can see all the partners that they, they have participated. So the process can be summarized in this uh, not so complicated uh, called smart uh, graph. So again, you can see that there are three steps. Uh, that is to design the round robin test, to measure to the different laboratories, and then to analyze the results. So in between, there is the transfer of information using what we call or what we are going to define this minimum information tables. So what we did at the beginning is to define which tables we are going to need to allow an optimized round robin test. That is, in our case, the participant information, equipment available, material that we are going to test, the SOP that we are going to follow, and the results and the analysis that will go around. So you can see that depending on which step we are, we are going to use specific uh, tables to transfer the data here okay so here i just wanted to show you a little bit more detail what we are calling a minimum information table so an explanation of each table so for example the main information that we are talking about the in the participant table is the institution and the contact person to allow good communication uh, for the equipment what we want is uh, to have a detailed and more, the most relevant information of that equipment that they are going to use, uh, for example, motor, manufacturer, which capabilities, that means in terms of uh, which temperature ranges can be tested, which type of materials. And for the materials, besides, uh, I will show you which material we, we selected internally, we also try to capture the sample preparation because this is a quite uh, source of uh, uncertainties and errors. One of the most tricky ones tables is the SOP, so is the standard operation procedure. So which uh, protocol test we are going to do, and that one is the the one that we want at the end to be defined to use as a as a standard, and it is the one that it took uh, more time and consensus, and it's still under development because the participants in this subtask have a quite number of pieces of equipment, different methods, different techniques, and different capabilities. And uh, for, uh, for the results, what we have is just what we collect is the number of samples we have been uh, testing, uh, how many repetitions, the average of the values calculated by each participant, temperature, and the uncertainties. So now I want to present a little bit more uh, in detail all these steps, all, all these tables. So this is, for example, a summary of the data collected of the partners related to the different pieces of equipment. So here you can see that there's a variation of sample size 
from milligram to tens of grams. And uh, different temperatures that can be tested. So people can go from some ambient to thousand degrees Celsius. Also the tests can be done in air, different protective gases. So here we can, or you can already see the many differences and sources, uh, sources of error due to a huge variety of pieces of equipment. So regarding the material, we selected a paraffin, a phase change material. This one melts around uh, 53, 58, uh, you can see here. And uh, really we selected this from Merck because it can be easily purchased by all the participants. We selected others, but not uh, they were not available in all the countries. And it's important that all of us can get the same material. In some cases, when there were uh, difficulties, we, what we did is to ship uh, the materials from one laboratory to, to the other one. So besides buying the material, we had to agree on sample preparation. Okay, so because the, the different equipments have a different shape and need to be, uh, it's depending on, on the equipment that they have. One of the issues that, that could happen is that the PCMs, uh, solid microstructure and crystallinity uh, could be affected uh, during the cooling rain. And because we need to mold and shape from the liquid uh, state uh, to the solid one to, sh to shape it, to have the desired uh, phase, we have to agree on um, the cooling rate we want it uh, to follow. So then we try to to establish two cooling protocols, one fast and another one slow. Here you can see the differences, one heating up to 70 to reach the liquid state and cool down to ambient. So we consider ambient temperature around 20 degrees from the lab and the other one to uh, cool it at a really slow cooling rate. So uh, a little bit below the, um, the melting point that was 50 degrees. Just here to highlight that some of the um, participants uh, noticed that they were having some cracks or some bubbles in the um, in the sample, so that could be also a source of error. So we tried to track and and uh, to write down all the sources of error that could be affecting our results and our uh, position. So let me change. So yeah, talking uh, about Procedures, I would like to present the, the ones that I mentioned before, the LFA and the, the uh, TPS, that are, those ones were the ones that more participants uh, had it or have it. And um, the idea is just to agree on a suitable and kind of easy way to follow this procedure for everyone. So as a common ground, all the um, participants, independently of the, the equipment, were testing uh, three different temperatures, 25, 40, and 50 degrees. For now, we have um, we have reasons to just measure in the solid phase because there's a few participants can can do it in the liquid phase, and uh, a minimum of three samples, all of us. And for the LFA. Uh, it was agreed specifically that for each temperature we were going to uh, measure five times, so five shots of the laser. But uh, we agreed on a minimum of three uh, measurements per temperature and sample. So here in the bottom right of the slide, you can see an example of sample preparation. So they are using some molds to shape uh, the it's 12.7 millimeter uh, disc. And here for, for TPS, uh, what I would like to mainly highlight and that although all the different TPS, the, the equipment, pieces of equipment um, that the participant had, uh, they, they use uh, uh, the same method. Uh, they use uh, different probes and they use then uh, different sample size. But in all the cases, uh, they need two halves uh, to prepare two halves uh, where the sensor goes in between. So you can see that here the variety of uh, sample preparation that uh, there was uh, captured. So you have from uh, 3D printed molds 
to others that they're used, I think, for normal baking or others manufactured with an aluminum case. So, again, another source of uh, error. So, and finally, this was the also the last steps to start the round robin test. We had to agree on uh, how we were going to to present the the results. How we were how we we're going to calculate the, the uncertainties of our measurements. So for calculating the uncertainties, we follow the ISO guide for uncertainties. Here you can have the, the reference. And first, we determine the standard uncertainties of our values by calculating the standard deviation of the mean, our values, and divided by the square root, just following these, these equations. And uh, just to, to say that in this case, it's just the, we calculated the uncertainty for the experimental values, but in some cases, according to this, um, to this guide, we can add the uncertainties of uh, uh, what it's called combined uncertainties of other parts of the equipment. It could be, for example, thermocouples, but we, we didn't reach that, that point. So, uh, if we calculate the standard uncertainty, the, the ones that um, you saw before, and we just uh, finished that, we are having a probability of roughly 60% of the values inside the normal distribution. So that means that one, almost one third or around one third of times the value will be outside. So what we did is what uh, to present the results in, in a, what it's called expanded uncertainty that is calculated from the standard one uh, by multiplying it by a coverage factor. Here you can see the, the table. So uh, at uh, k it equal to, that it's the most common way to, when, uh, of expressing uncertainty of measurement and analysis results, uh, we're having a confidence interval of 95%. That's uh, a more um, robust way of presenting our results. So just also another note that, that uh, this approach is just calculating the empirical or experimental uncertainty of the, the results. That could lead to precise results, but they can be far from the real one. And for that, uh, what we should do, and it's one of the next steps, is just to have the, the uncertainty of the systematic uh, error that that comes from from the equipment that that it stands through the use of standard materials okay so i wanted to present here a, a summary of the challenges that we have encountered so far in terms of equipment sample preparation uh, resource analysis uh, that makes more difficult to or can make more difficult to to compare the results if we don't fully agree and uh, assess them. So one of the main challenges that uh, we're having in this, but also we see it as an opportunity and we're keen on testing uh, as much as uh, pieces of equipment that participants uh, have, is that um, uh, we aim to understand uh, how their different uh, methods and techniques increase the variability and results. And uh, here we have, we we're talking about the transient methods and um, steady state methods, but within completely different techniques. So, so that was uh, quite a bit challenging because it made us to prepare a uh, few standard operation procedures for each one of these ones. So uh, this, another one was about the sample. So um sample different sample size um, uh, how i present it gives uh, different ways to prepare and shape your sample but also uh, different uh, results in terms of bubble trap during the, the cooling rate or uh, different um would we say cooling um cooling rate yeah because of uh bigger mass so we are having uh far bigger, um, it's in some cases around tens of grams that it, uh, due to the paraffin that it has a low thermal conductivity, it takes longer to cool down. So it doesn't follow 
the same uh, cooling rate that small samples. And uh, this one is uh, the, the step that we're currently analyzing a few results. And what we have seen is that uh, we are uh, still in the process of uh, agreeing on how we're calculating the, the uncertainties because uh, I've seen that some partners have uh, sent me uh, different ways to calculate the uncertainties. So we are uh, still in, in that part of the challenge. So the next step that we want from, from this task is to analyze all the values measured. This is the, the next, this is gonna be the next uh, meeting that we have all the, all the results, sorry. And um, we're gonna compare the, all the uncertainties and we are trying to compare within the same uh, technique but also with different techniques. So we were, we were trying to see uh, how we can adjust our data and have a precise and accurate result. And uh, so- Jimena, can you speed up a yeah. bit? Because um, we are advancing in time, yeah. thanks. Perfect. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm almost, almost there. So uh, after all doing all of this uh, assessment, what we, do, uh, we want to do is, uh, go for second round of uh, round robin tests uh, adjusting with the um, with what we have learned from from this previous uh, test and maybe in the future explore new materials so pcms for example liquid state or inorganic materials that we are testing uh, just uh, organics and uh, trying to also test uh, thermochemical energy storage materials so really thank you for your attention and looking forward for the question and answer session. Perfect, Helena, thanks a lot. Uh, this was showed very well how the complicated Robin, round robin tests are and how important they are also to get standard into material science. Thank you very much for giving us this insight. It was very, very excellent. So I have to introduce the next speaker. We will go through the presentations first and we will gather the questions. Please type them in as you do right now and we will have a Q&A at the end. So we have another doctor. It's uh, this time Dr. Gerald Engelmeyer. He is assistant professor at the Department of Civil and Mechanical Engineering at the Techno Techni Technical University of Denmark. And he received his PhD in 2019. His research focuses on camp compact thermal energy storage for flexible solar heating and cooling systems, including experimental development and demonstration. Gerald teaches in Denmark and Greenland and has 10 years of research experience working in Denmark, China and Austria after he graduated in energy as energy engineer in Austria. He has the title of his presentation today is State of Charge Determination Using Material Response in Compact Thermal Energy Storage. I'm looking forward to your presentation, Gerald. Thank you, Bebel. I will share my screen. All right, we are set to go. Perfect, okay, yes. Well, I will talk about state of charge determination utilizing material response. And this is uh, work results after two years, which are led by myself and by my colleague, Peter Chaber from Natural Resources Canada. Why state of charge determination? So the idea is to enable integration of compact storage in interaction with advanced, you can also say predictive controls in energy systems. And to do it reliable, will potentially pave the way for flexible heating and cooling systems, which can also contribute to what management people would call reserve market access. Our definitions, which we made in this task, is what we would like to implement as a thermal battery, is a thermal storage with instantaneous charge determination, which means you do not rely on the measurement of heat flux. You can actually plug off the storage, you measure and you instantaneously know what's going on. And we will utilize a response from a material bulk. However, the term or the parameter state of charge is a component level property. 
like when you buy an electrical battery, you also measure the state of charge of the entire item with different chemicals inside, for example. And it's defined as the heat content accumulated or at a specific time divided through the maximum capacity. We started with a survey. We had a look uh, what is available in terms of uh, uh, measurement techniques. Well, quite a list for PCM and even a bigger list for TCM, thermochemical materials. So what we did is to reach out to all the partner institutions. We convinced 11 of them, oh sorry, 21 of them from 11 different countries to report their studies they have done in the past or currently. And then we had a different picture. We basically saw a focus for phase change materials on measuring the bulk temperature, which is the standard for labs in order to make models, for example, and um, a couple of investigations also in material labs on a smaller scale with the newer methodologies. It was vice versa for thermochemical materials, where you had a huge variety of investigations from the material labs, but only a few which uh, scaled up so you, we can say that's a pilot storage where you try to investigate something. And just to highlight what it is, PCM I mentioned temperature and pressure, and for thermochemical materials it's mostly also temperature in combination with weight of pressure when we talk about sorption or thermogravimetric measurements or simply to measure how much is in a vessel of a reactor. All right, after this step, we decided to make our own research classification for this rather new fields. First level is material bulk response. So basically, we measure with any new developed device a sensitivity across the state of charge. Second step. We build a pilot, or like for the pilot labs, to identify the correlation of this signal from the material response to the actual heat content. And the third step in our classification is to understand or to define how can it be used in systems and what are the requirements to make the system work flexible. And in the next minutes, I will show you some exemplary proof of concepts from our institutes. It's not a complete list, um, but something to trigger some discussion. And I will start with material, then component, and then system level. First example is from the German Airspace uh, Research Center. Um, it's a storage pilot for sodium hydroxide. So for high, I'm sorry, sodium nitrate for high temperature storage. And here we have an example where we have discharge at 290 degrees constantly. The melting temperature is a phase change material inside is 306 degrees. And you can then see from top to bottom that you have a signal of the electrodes which are placed vertically. So Again, it's a material level example where you can actually see that we have a proof of concept. It works. Of course, for a complete methodology, then you need some calibration work. Another example from Spain, from the University of Leda. They created a setup where there is phase change material in a closed chamber, equipped with temperature measurement points and also pressure of a closed chamber. And then water by heat exchanges passing through heating and cooling the phase change material. And what was observed is basically that there is a clear correlation of temperature sensors and pressure. So it was as sensitive. But the pressure is a global parameter, while the temperature depends where you measure it. And also, if you know the density change of the air and the PCM inside here, then you can, that's indicated by this valley, clearly see when the phase change is actually going on. First, the solidification from liquid to solid, and then from solid to liquid again. 
the melting temperature here was four degrees. Going to thermochemical materials, we're switching to colleagues from FH Upper Austria. They developed a capacitive sensor applied to different zeolite material. And they showed us that the relative permittivity can be used as a sensitive signal to the water content of this zeolite. So when zeolite takes a board, it releases it and it needs it to dry it again. And this is also a storage material. And yeah, they explained it for three different materials, all are sensitive. It's a promising approach. We stay in Austria, experts from TU Vienna. They are working with higher temperature thermochemical reactions, and they have applied optical properties, UV reflectance. So here, what we can see is basically two responses, the red line and the blue line. There we have a comparison of how does the response look with solid copper chloride. There's a different spectrum in comparison to copper chloride and ammonia. And this ammonia, this is a certain, uh, how to say, composite. And on, the, and on the way, when you use it as a storage materials, you have different curves, and then you can track optically what is going on. Now, let's go one step further. Let's discuss what you can do when you have a complete system. And this system is built in Luzern, and it's a thermochemical reaction using aqueous sodium hydroxide and by making the solution more concentrated it requires heat which can be stored in a, in a tank and you can apply it by diluting it with water via heat exchange and then you release heat and simply by knowing how much is remaining in the concentrated tank you know what is the state of charge of your system that's a quite easy example it's not always that easy one example from phase change materials from our lab at the TTU. So what we made here is a pilot for cold storage. We equipped a heat exchanger and material container with internal measurement, like 15 thermocouples we placed in here. And then during pilot testing with a lot of different inlet temperatures, for both melting and solidification, we were able to find a correlation. And this is the graphical explanation for this correlation. Uh, the purpose is cooling and the melting temperature is here 15 degrees Celsius. And which brings me to the next level of systems. When we have this model, we can, for example, you apply it for development of control algorithms for an entire server room cooling system in order to know how to actually place and apply uh, cold storage in the right way, which is a novel system. And my final example goes to an actual product developed by Neothermal Energy Storage in Canada. And part of their development was to identify locations inside a phase change material storage with a melting temperature of 58 to know how to control it for different modes and those modes are for example operation states like full cell charge partial cell charge and that's important for that type it needs nucleation activation so the pcm crystallize on demand and this needs to be detected by selected locations and it also tells the user or the system then when the cell is completely discharged and when you need to recharge it or activate another unit. Preliminary conclusions from our work, in one year we are ready, and then we publish a report or maybe a paper even. So it's the material bulk response we are aiming to investigate. The state of charge is, however, a component level property, including the insulation, the container, and also the heat exchanger. And it's a prerequisite for flexible system operation, in our opinion, to make it quick and reliable. For PCM, the development is basically, we know how to measure the bulk temperature, with, together with heat flux. 
that's maybe too complex for products and we are therefore looking for novel techniques for mass application. And TCM, we have basically already um, tracking the absorbent content of sorption materials or measuring the mass of reactants in closed vessels. However, we need more non-intrusive techniques for large applications and for high temperature applications. Which brings me to the final statement. There is still a long way to go. We have first solutions, but we need more applied research to bring material science and system engineering together. Thank you very much. They're right. I think we don't want to hear that there's still a long way to go. We have energy transition in front of us and we need storages extremely urgently. But I know yeah. that I, I think you gave us already some glance into what systems could look like and what complex questions will show up once you go to the system level. So thank you for that. We um, already have solutions. Sorry, I want to say that. Okay, okay, you added that one. So that makes us again optimistic. So we come to our last speaker today, um, which is Angel Serrano, another doctor. You see that I think doctors are very frequent in this uh, material research science. Uh, he's associated researcher at the Spanish research center CIS Energy Gun. He received his PhD in chemical and environmental engineering from the University of Castilla-La Mancha in Spain in 2018. And Angel holds expertise in developing phase change materials for energy storage across a wide temperature range. I'm excited about that from 40 to 600 degree. And he's actively involved in industrial, national and European projects. The title of his presentation today is Stability Mapping with Examples of PCMs and TCMs. So please, Angel, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Can you see now my screen? Yes, but not yet yes. in the presenter mode. But it might come because it's a bit, yeah, yeah, here we go. Maybe now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, Barbell. As you have mentioned, I will show you uh, stability mapping with some representative examples of TCMs and, and TCMs. Let's start by mentioning that the evaluation of the, of the TCMs and the TCM stability is gaining relevance because the thermal energy storage systems based on Latin heat and thermochemical heat are approaching the energy market. By 2030, these systems are expected to increase their durability, getting closer to the lifetime of systems based on sensible heat. Therefore, the stability evaluation of the main elements, in this case, TCMs and the TCMs, is crucial. To define this material stability, let's initially focus on the main target of this stability, which is to achieve the test durability. And here in the test durability, two main elements appear. The time to maintain the performance and within established operational conditions. Therefore, we can use these two elements to define the PCM and TCM stability. A material is stable when it ensures consistent properties, avoiding decreasing the test system performance, and considering the operational conditions. So once we have a definition, what can we find in the literature related to this stability evaluation? Well, a few works have already made this initial effort to compile methodologies and present interesting approaches to address stability, but mainly focus on PCS. Here are three examples that I consider relevant from 10 years ago, five years ago, and the last one even from this year. They have uh, different approaches, but they all agree on one thing. There is no common standard or guideline for assessing the stability of these types of, of materials. Then, how do we perform this evaluation? As I initially mentioned, the application approach focuses only on properties affecting the test performance and testing within the fine operational conditions. However, in the early stages of material development, this application may not be clear or defined. Therefore, in these early stages, we can focus on phenomena inherent to the material, such as degradation or sublimation temperature. As we define the application, we can incorporate new elements, such as the environment or operating conditions, for example, during the thermal cycle. And finally, we can even consider 
elements related to the system integration. For example, compatibility with heat transfer fluids or compatibility with heat exchangers. Hence, the application focus brings into play both operational conditions and external agents affecting the PCM and the TCM. To clarify how this evaluation can be done, I'm going to show you five representative cases, three for PCNs and two for TCNs, with different approaches when assessing the stability. Due to the limited time, some of these cases are explained in more detail in the annex attached to this presentation, but at least I would like to mention the main singularity. We start with a case from Frank Hofer, focused on assessing and understanding the aging of erythritol which is a sugar alcohol. This is a common approach uh, when starting the stability assessment of a new material. On the top table, you can see the four main parameters defining the stability test. Testing conditions, properties to follow the stability, testing device, and techniques to understand the observations. To give you a brief background about the materials, sugar alcohols like erythritol are solid liquid PCNs with very high latent heat at medium temperature but with some challenges, overall related with crystallization and polymorphism. For example, erythritol has a stable phase at 120 Celsius degrees and a metastable phase at 106 Celsius degrees. With this in mind, in this case, they perform aging tests by subjecting the material to temperatures 10, 20 and 30 degrees above its melting point. In addition to the change of color, as it is evident in the picture, the stability was evaluated by monitoring the latent heat and melting temperatures over the time. Also, some complementary techniques, such as attenuated total reflection spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy, were used to assess this degradation. In the graph on the right, we can see, just as an example, the detection frequencies of the stable phase in green and the metastable phase in dark blue for erythritol as well as when there was no crystallization in light blue for different aging, aging temperatures over the time. They conclude that increasing aging temperature and time increases the probability of metastable phase, reducing the melting point and also decreasing the enthalpy of fusion. This is a basic example of the evaluation of stability and understanding the reasons behind this. Let's move now to a similar approach, but in this case applied to solid-solid PCLs, and more specifically to organic plastic crystals evaluated at CIC energy units. Briefly, organic plastic crystals are highly, are highly energetic solid-solid PCLs with a transition from a low temperature crystal phase to a high temperature plastic phase. In this transition, they are breaking hydrogen bonds, and that's why their latent heat is high. They are very simple molecules with different numbers of hydroxyl, uh, hydroxyl groups, which provide quite different transition temperature. Two of the main representative cases are pentaglycerin, PG, with three hydroxyl groups and a transition temperature of 80 Celsius degrees, and pentaglycerin with four hydroxyl groups, a transition temperature of around 190 Celsius degrees, and a latent heat up to 300 joules per gram. One of the main advantages of these materials is that we can combine them to continuously adjust their transition temperature. And in this case, we test one of these binary combination of P, P, G, with an adjusted transition temperature at around 150 Celsius degrees. As in the previous case with sugar alcohols, the first thing to evaluate is the material stability when it is subjected to temperatures beyond its transition temperature. Here we use a thermogrammetric analysis to follow the mass loss, the blue line, with respect to the temperature, which is the, the red line. And it is evident from the graph that there is mass loss within the expected working temperature of the material. For the evaluation of the condensed material, we conclude that the binary system is sublimating in the plastic phase. Thanks to this initial assessment, we can propose solutions that mitigate or even eliminate this potential stability issue. For instance, through the use of external elements such as coatings. As an example, coatings with low vapor permeability can avoid these problems related with sublimation. In this case, we test binary combination in a closed system, subjecting the material to 150 thermal cycles between 120 to 200 Celsius degrees. 
And as we can see on the graph, the thermal properties evaluated in a TSC are not affected by the thermal cycling after 150 cycles. Therefore, we are able to mitigate this initial sublimation working in a closed system. To finish with PCMs, we have now a case from CMA focusing on fatty acids. The main singularity here is that they use this initial stability evaluation to design lifetime models and to predict the PCM's long-term behavior. You can find more information in the annex attached to this presentation uh, because it is a really interesting uh, approach for the evaluation of the degradation. Now let's uh, shift our focus to thermochemical materials, TCMs, where there are fewer reported cases of the stability evaluation compared to PCMs. Here is a case for, from the National Institute of, Chem of Chemistry in uh, Slovenia. They use the sorption processes of water vapor in a zeolite to store the energy. As a brief explanation, under the influence of a heat supply, the water is dissolved from the zeolite in an endothermic process, corresponding to the charging of the storage material. On the contrary, when the water is absorbed onto the zeolite, the heat is released in an exothermic process, achieving the discharging of the material. In this specific case, they are proposing the use of a commercial granulated binder-free zeolite as the absorbent material. The water sorption capacity of binder-free zeolites is higher than that of zeolites containing, containing binders. However, the main drawback is their high desorption temperature, in this case, 140 Celsius degrees. This high desorption temperature can be reduced by modifying the hydrophilicity of the zeolite. And in this case, in this case, it's exactly what they are trying uh, by modifying, by uh, applying different chemical treatments. In addition to this, tar uh, to this target, they are also evaluating the cyclic hydrothermal stability of the zeolites. So let's focus on this point. For this assessment, the samples were exposed to 20 absorption desorption cycles between temperature of 40 Celsius degrees to 140 Celsius degrees at a constant water vapor pressure. At the end, the stability is evaluated by comparing the water uptakes of the samples at a specific temperature and vapor pressure before and after cycling. Apart from the results, the differences in assessing the stability of PCM and a TCM are evident. Here, in addition to the temperature, the pressure is a key factor to control, especially in systems involving gases or vapors. In addition, the number of cycles usually performed is significantly lower than in the case of the PCMs, where it is common to reach more than 1,000 thermal cycles during the stability assessment. Finally, this is the last uh, example of TCM that you can see in detail in the annex, carried out by the Cartoon University in Australia. In this case, uh, it is not a source and desorption, but it is a decomposition carbonation reaction with metal carbon, involving carbon dioxide. Temperature here reached more than 1,000 Celsius degrees, and the evaluation of the stability is performed at a constant temperature by changing the pressure of carbon dioxide in the system. It is a very interesting case where they even deal with sintering problems by doping with nickel, nickel particles. As you, have, as you have seen, the variety of approaches and techniques for assessing the stability of these materials is extensive. It is necessary to have a set of recommendations that at least allow us to make some comparisons between the materials of the same family. In subtas D, we are mapping the potential degradation mechanisms for each type of PCM and TCM, including degradation factors and their effect on the material. At the end, the identification of these elements will allow for more efficient stability testing, long-term prediction, and more accurate problem-solving strategies. This is all uh, from our site. Um, I recommend you to download the presentation and to check the details in the annex uh, for its uh, representative case. Yeah, welcome from my side to this Q&A session. A warm welcome. We are back here. Thanks for logging in again. I hope you enjoyed the recording. We have all the speakers here with me. Please uh, um, make your videos active. 
and we will start straight away into a um, hopefully exciting Q&A. We have already some questions from the previous recording and uh, please you can type in more questions um, if you feel that you really need to know more. Well, uh, I think there was one uh, really interesting question asking uh, the speakers whether um, there, all this testing is really necessary or whether there is like a, a hidden champion already anyway visible among the materials so that we can go straight for products. Vim, maybe we start with you and then somebody else wants to comment on that? It's a very good question here, thank you. Hidden champions, yeah. I guess that there are already some champions on, on the market. If we look at um, uh, PCMs, um, there's a lot of PCMs already produced, also commercially, and they are applied in, uh, in diverse uh, areas, for for instance, uh, for, for comfort cooling, but also for uh, storage of, uh, of heat uh, in order to, to store the heat when electricity is cheap and then use the heat later. This is in the domestic appliances, and there's a Scottish company, Sunamp, that is using these uh, devices and bringing it on the market. And for absorption materials, there's um, already since uh, eight years now uh, a dishwasher on the market that uses zeolite, absorption material, in order to make the uh, dishwashing process much uh, efficient, much more efficient. And uh, therefore, it saves um, some something like 25% uh, of electricity per uh, dishwash uh, treat. So these are all, uh, already obvious champions and the, mm, the research and the developments that we do in the task is in order to, to unveil the, the, the champions of tomorrow. <laughs> so you have a little tip for the champion of tomorrow. Who could be in which range and what, what is successful in all your testing? Angel, you did a lot of testing. What is your hidden champion for the future? I mean, uh, I think for, it's for the future. Sorry. 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 Angel, it's for you. Sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> OK. Uh, it, it will depend on the temperature. Uh, I can tell you the champions of today. At low temperature, for example, it's quite common to use the paraffins. They, they, don't have almost any problem in the range of, of temperature that they are usually used. It is true that uh, the competition against water is, is difficult because of the price, but it is one of the champions. If we increase the, the temperature, we have also more tensiles. Uh, there are now new proposals of using these materials uh, using this phase chain, their phase change, not only the sensible heat. And if we go beyond to even higher temperature, we start having some uh, options with metal alloys, uh, but it still is uh, it's not easy to, to choose a specific champion because, because it is going to depend on the specific application and the requirements, the specific requirements. But of course, we, we have a lot of uh, possibilities. Okay. Gerald, do you want to comment also? I just want to say from an <clears throat> application specific point, the in the DTU, we do a lot of research with industry. I think it's important to say that we have a lot of new applications coming up uh, due to the change or what you, what you would call green energy transition. So I think it's important to be open for uh, new application fields, new temperature ranges, and to develop and test materials simultaneously. Okay. Um, there's another general question uh, regarding if you want to get more into storage, uh, you know, like compact storage research or material research, what sources are available which might not be, you know, at the very stage of current research, but a more basic um, introduction? What ideas do you have to recommend here, Wim? Yeah, from a general point of view, there, there are a, f a number of um, review articles that have been published uh, the last uh, four years. So this is a, mm -hmm. a good uh, way to very quickly have an overview of what research and development is going on. And then furthermore, we had some uh, previous uh, talks on compact thermal energy storage. So this, this task now is, is the, the fourth in row, and we had mm -hmm. three prior to this. And you could look at the 
IEA solar heating and cooling website to look for the other task and see what uh, publications uh, we had there. And most of the publications also have um, reference lists in which you can further deepen uh, the, the knowledge of uh, compact thermal energy storage. Okay, good. So more than almost 20 years of research within the IEA solar heating and cooling program. Very exciting. Uh, Helena, we have a, a question regarding your presentation, which says, that your, does your current research task consider the analysis of phase change materials with nanoparticles? Yeah, uh, regarding that question, I've been working personally with um, uh, different materials with nanoparticles, and they are quite tricky to, to measure, because still uh, the stability of the... Um, the material that you, you can prepare, uh, it's a little bit compromised with time and people are researching that uh, in that area using uh, stabilizers. But for this uh, specific task, what we focus in is into having protocols to measure phase change materials. And uh, the way that we started is to have a really uh, stable uh, PCM, in this case, the paraffin. So we can really focus on the protocol and which parameters we need to use in each equipment to have really a good accuracy uh, among all the laboratories. So that's one of the reasons that we didn't use uh, nanoparticles mm -hmm. to start with. Okay. Another question, uh, which are the in encapsulated methods considered in the testing of PCM? For uh, encapsulating method, method uh, there are already a few reviews in the literature that you can find, but mm -hmm. they are really depending on the temperature range that you are working. So if you want to encapsulate a phase change material to avoid leakage or just to use it in a passive system, uh, if you are talking with uh, buildings that already been, uh, mentioned, there are some commercial products. We are talking about uh, polymer, polymers because it's cheap, it's well studied, and then those ones they have been used in, um, in pharmaceuticals for other purposes, and we have been uh, using it uh, in these organic materials. But if you go to higher temperatures, in that now it's a few countries are trying to move to industrial decarbonization, then you cannot use polymers anymore. They are not stable, they decompose. And then what you are using is uh, inorganic materials. Uh, it could be silica, it could be alumina to encapsulate just to reach 500 degrees, for example, or you move to, to metals, to alloys for this kind of temperatures. Okay, thank you. Gerald, um, a question for you. Um, can you reflect on the accuracy of different methods for state of charge? Thank you. Um, I start maybe with the most common method, which is temperature for PCM, but also for some thermochemical uh, storage processes. Um, example given for latent storage, temperature can be used to some extent because during the phase change, you don't have a big increase or decrease of temperature depending on melting or solidification. So, it would be favorable to have some novel non-intrusive method for that. And then as I showed in my presentation, we have a, a number of new approaches uh, which are now implemented first in pilot in the lab, but they are more sensitive in the specific reaction range. And that's very obvious for PCM, but also for thermochemical uh, processes like sorption or reactions. You, you have a need for tracking the reaction in a state where you don't really have a temperature change. And therefore, it's important to have these new methodologies to at any given point of time uh, when you have a system to detect what is going on in your storage. Okay, thank you. Um, another question maybe for you. Um, how do you calculate the thermal capacity of a compact storage um, when it contains, that contains water and is stationary without flow. That is a bit of a contradiction, either PC, well, either compact storage with uh, other material, but maybe you answer the question for a compact thermal energy storage mm -hmm. with a PCM or TCM, and how do you calculate capacities there? Thank you. I mean, 
that's more related to the components. So basically you have a storage where you have the material, a heat exchanger and a heat transfer fluid. That's the end then some insulation around. And coming back to state of charge, that should be, for example, a component uh, property, which means it includes everything. And then the technique should then be related to the heat content of the overall unit, which is also like ECM, also the sensible capacity of the heat transfer fluid or the heat exchange material. And that's also the same you, you experience in other fields like electrical batteries. We also relate the capacity to the whole unit. And so it is when we talk about thermal batteries. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, another question for you. Um, where is the effectiveness of additives like graphite and aluminium flakes to PCM materials? Uh, to, to improve thermal conductivity? That was the question, like, precisely. To me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting. We had some research earlier, like some colleagues of mine, applying it to phase change materials. However, then it's about the long-term stability whenever you add something to a material composition. And then the question is, depending on the temperatures you apply, can these uh, additives sustain long enough for a certain application? I know that the uh, stability testing like Ankel is working with, so also Helena uh, in the lab, there are different methods to estimate that, or determine that, I should say. Yeah. Okay, okay. still work. Um, I'm not sure, you are an Austrian, maybe this you could be answered by you or Wim. Um, products that are included in ceilings or floors to increase the, the, the mass of the building, you know, the um, storage mass of the building. Is PCM used for that? Because sometimes it's only the, the cement which is used as, as thermal mass. Have you experiences on that? Um, I, I know that, that uh, some... Ten years ago, at least, there, there was a German company that had a, a commercial product in which they had a PCM enforced uh, tiles for ceilings, so for ceilings for offices that were used to uh, support the um, the cooling uh, system of uh, of a building. And they, uh, with this ceiling, it's uh, it's possible to have a, a more even uh, comfort uh, cooling temperature in the in the room. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware whether this product is still on the market, but this is one of the niches indeed in which you can apply uh, phase change materials and their property of having a very high CP in a, in a very small temperature range. Okay, thank you. You want to add? Oh, no. Yeah, I can add that. That's a very good point. Uh, besides the actual thermal storage, there is a solution where you also have an additional value for increasing the thermal comfort. I mean, at DTU we have a group dedicated to indoor air environment and uh, they also work with these solutions and their focus is basically the increase of comfort. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is also a question uh, regarding uh, which says uh, would I, he would like to know a bit more about integrating PCM with uh, vacuum tube collectors, any new materials. But I'm not sure whether it depends on the collector type you have. It's normal, well, normal heat you store into a storage tank. So what is your answer on that? Maybe Gerald again or Angel, I'm not sure. Gerald is our, our PCM specialist here. <laughs> well, generally I can say combination with uh, heat sources also means careful selection of uh, the maximum operation temperature when you have PCM because that's directly influencing the stability. Ah, okay. This is maybe the first point I can mention, yes, but uh, I, I, I did not work with this combination. I, I don't know if somebody here had an experience with combining solar collectors with PCM directly. No, I can say that Sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I can say that in the world of uh, the combination of PV and solar thermal, so PVT, there have been some, some projects in which the effectivity of combining a small layer, a thin layer of PCM at the backside of the PV 
that would lead to um, the prevention of overheating of the PV uh, in this uh, PVT system. So that there have been some research, but to my knowledge, there are no commercial products at, at the moment. Okay, oh, also an interesting approach. Okay. Uh, Angel, a question for you, a technical one. How feasible would be the extensive use of coatings for mitigating sublimation of plastic crystals used in engineering applications? Uh, thank you, Arvel. It is a good, a good question uh, because having some uh, coatings uh, that solving the problems of these plastic crystals uh, is uh, a big step uh, for reaching for these materials to, to reach uh, the market. Uh, in this case, it, it is a challenge because there are some uh, some uh, issues to solve, like the volume change of the TCM, even if it is small because we are working with solid solid TCMs, uh, the sublimation and also the compatibility of these uh, materials or the non-compatibility of these materials with water, which makes uh, difficult the, the deposition of uh, certain uh, coatings. In any case, if we take all these uh, limitations from the beginning in the design of the coating, I think that it is uh, possible to achieve a cost-effective uh, solution that can be applied at industrial level. Mm -hmm. oh, good news. How about um, stability of, of PCMs and TCMs you worked with? Is this a degradation? Is this an issue that you face a lot in, in the different materials you observe? Not really, but it is something that we, uh, we need to evaluate from the beginning in order to know what are the limitations in the applications. It doesn't mean that at the end in the application we will face this, this degradation. And normally it is the case when we choose a, a material uh, is because we are not going to have these these future problems but it is important to know uh, uh, and to have this idea about the possible degradation mechanisms to predict the long-term behavior okay uh, maybe a last question um, regarding you, Angel. Um, how about high temperature storages? I think in your uh, Vita you said that you do until 400 degree and we have a big need of industrial heat above 200 or 150 degree. So uh, do you see it really feasible to, to have in which time range storages for this kind of applications that are compact and have all these nice features of, of you know, be having mm. up to five less space or less costs or whatever? It, uh, yes, it is a roaming field uh, because the, the needs of heat at high temperature are growing overall because of, of this electrification and, and the decarbonization of the industry. Nowadays, uh, most of the solutions are based on sensible heat but if we want to apply this kind of solution or thermal energy storage in, in industries where the space is really important, we, we need to find some PCM or TCM based solutions. Nowadays, we are working in, in different approaches, for example, based on metal alloys in combination with, with, other, with, with other sensible materials that are able to store the energy up to 950 degrees, more or less. So, so we already have some potential candidates. And nowadays, what we are evaluating is uh, is the stability, how many ah, thermal yeah, cycles the uh, okay. we can work with these materials. Yes. Okay, but if I remember, oh, Helena, we yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just to complement what uh, Angel said, uh, we have been working also in. I'm located in West Midlands in the UK, and there is still a um, heavy industry, foundry industry. Around and we have been working closely with uh, different companies, and uh, we had now a pilot uh, test where we are using part of the sand that uh, they use for molding as a material for uh, that we develop uh, with a PCM. So we have kind of a composite phase change material, and in that one we are storing heat uh, from the processes. In that case, it's around 400, 500 degrees. Uh, and we are testing the, that part. So we have a kind of small, uh, I think it's 1.2 tons, uh, mm -hmm. and we are we are working on that. And the company is really it's uh, it's keen on using because it's uh, in that case they were not using anything to capture that wet heat. So okay. I think things are moving on 
in in the in the end of high the temperature, temperature uh, range. storage. Yeah. Okay. I I would imagine that um, the heat exchanger and loading and unloading is a very crucial step. I mean, the material and its stability is one thing, but you know the infrastructure of the storage tank is another one. So you are, as I understand correctly, you are already in a pilot stage of really having a, a larger sized pilot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, I think it's a, we were trying to have modular system so we can adapt in different. Uh, different industry with different uh, needs so that's the uh, yeah that uh, that that was the the idea and uh, now we are uh, in the testing uh, side we're, what we are trying to do is just to have uh we have a direct uh, heat exchange between the the cpcm that kind of breaks with air from the whatever oh, okay. uh, source from the industry is this already published uh, in a in a way or we're, we're trying to so it's in the reviewing process so oh, hopefully it's for soon. A paper okay yeah, yeah. Oh, good so we can get back to you in some weeks or months sometimes it takes a while with these papers <laughs> okay yeah i think there are no more questions thank you very much um thanks for answering the question thanks to the participants for logging in again and asking a lot of interesting questions all have a very nice day and I will hand back to Arabella for the final words. Yes, thank you very much, Bergo. Thank you very much to all of the panelists for answering all of our questions. Thank you for the attendees for joining us. Before we close, I have a few more final words to say. Um, yes, there will be a webinar recording of the broadcast that many of you saw just now, as well as this Q&A session. So we be on the lookout for that and you will also have access to the presenters uh, presentations and they will be online on the ICE as well as the IEA SSC homepage in a few days and then I have a save the date to announce which I'm quite happy to share and that is that we are once again putting on Eurosun many of you may know about it already it's the ISIS and IEA SSC International Conference on Sustainable and Solar Energy for Buildings and Industry. And Eurosun 2024 is going to take place the last week of August next year in Limassol in Cyprus. The call for papers is coming soon as well. So stay tuned for that and mark the dates in your calendar. And then finally, thank you for joining us. If you want to stay in touch, you can always email me at public.relations at isis.org and you can find us on all the relevant social media channels. And with that, a big thank you for, to the attendees and to the panelists for coming on again. And goodbye and see you on the next webinar. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye.